If you're new with us, we are studying the book of Ecclesiastes, a book that deals with the, the stuff of life and the frustration of life, the futility of, of life, that feeling of vanity, vanity, all is vanity, life under the sun. We've talked about despair and joy. Uh, we've talked about time and eternity, and today uh, we talk about hardship and companionship. And so let's pray together as we uh, jump into chapter four. Lord Jesus, truly you are worthy, worthy of our lives worthy of our attention now in your word when we think about the fact that one day we will see you. We will actually see you. Our faith will be turned to sight. We worship not a vague, mystical Christ, but a real Christ whom we will see one day. And so I pray that in light of that incredible fact, you would teach us how to live wisely now in this brief life that we have. We pray this in Jesus' good name. Amen. So let's talk about people today, people in general and companionship in particular. I don't know if you guys have noticed it, but there are a lot of people in the world. Uh, what do we do with all these people? Um, who do you befriend? Uh, who do you listen to? Uh, who needs you? These are all very important questions, right? Um, who should you be aware of? Uh, these are very important questions in times of transition as this is uh, one of those places in RDU where people move in and out all the time. Uh, perhaps you're starting a new school or you're uh, starting a new job, you've moved to a new city or maybe you're looking for a new church. The question of friendship and companionship and community is at the center of our interests. And so it's very important. It's also very important uh, and you're made aware of its importance, the, the value of relationships when someone close to you uh, departs. Obviously, death is the most painful experience in that regard, but, but sometimes just for a short-term, uh, perhaps mission assignment or uh, military relocation or something along those lines make you feel that sense of loneliness, that longing for a community. A few weeks ago, Brad McElyer walked into this room with his two daughters, and I knew that he had been home alone for about a week because Jill was on an IGP trip, and he just had that look on his face. Uh, you know, like, this guy needed a hug. And so I, I know that feeling. And we had a bro moment as, as uh, I, I ex express my, my care for him. It's not good for man to be alone. You remember that? That is before the fall uh, that was said. The only thing that was not good was that man was alone. We're made for relationships. This, this comes not just in the form of marriage, of course, but it comes in the form of friendship. It comes in the form of community in the church. We're made for relationships because we're made by God who is a relational God. Now, the early chapters of uh, uh, Ecclesiastes have drawn our attention back to the early chapters of Genesis as we've been thinking about the toil and the frustration of work, uh, the consequences of the fall, death uh, has, has appeared and reappeared. And now this, this theme of companionship is also uh, an echo of those early chapters of Genesis. You see the, the theme of, of loneliness running right through this, this passage that John read uh, so well and so deeply. Um, I love his voice. Uh, loneliness. So right off the bat, he mentions the oppressed, and they're lonely. They have no one to comfort them. And then he talks about uh, how the wealthy business person who is scurrying about to, to get more and more stuff has no friends, no family. And then finally we end up at the level of a king who is alone at the top. And so there's much wisdom here in the book of Ecclesiastes. And what we see here is that relationships are more important than achievements. Relationships are more important than wealth. And that contentment with relationships is way better than being famous, way better than being wealthy. One writer put it, when a man dies, no matter his talents and his influence and genius, if he dies unloved, his life must be a failure to him and his dying a cold horror. But that's not the way a lot of us in the West think. We've been raised in rugged individualism most of our lives. And therefore, as David Gibson pointed out, the, the primary questions that we tend to raise are about us as individuals. Where am I going with my life? What am I doing today? Gibson says, the one person I am always acutely aware of is me. But the preacher here in Ecclesiastes is trying to get us to live in a better way, 
This word better is very important. You'll notice it if you just scan the page there. Uh, one of these proverbial ways of writing uh, a comparison. Here is a better way to live. You'll see clusters of these better than sayings in chapter 4, and there's, uh, there's another set of them in chapter 7. And we do this sort of thing all the time when we say things like, you know, MJ is better than LeBron. Popeye's chicken, amen. Uh, Popeye's chicken sandwich is better than Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You always hit a nerve when you diss Chick-fil-A in church. (laughs) I remember someone leaving the church one time because I said I didn't like Chick-fil-A. But anyway, um, they'll get over it. Um, I'm not saying, I'm not making these claims. These are examples, people, okay? These are examples, all right? Just calm down. Everybody calm down. I don't care where you eat your chicken at. Uh, You know, Apple is better than Samsung. Uh, Duke is, let's not go there. Uh, It's too soon, way too soon. Uh, Maranatha. Uh, The... And what the writer is saying here is that we are better together. We're better together. And so the question is not so much how am I doing, that is a real question, an important question, but how are we doing? There's a better way to live and it involves relationships. If you have friends, family, neighbors, spouse, brothers, sisters here in the church, that brings meaning and joy. That's what Ecclesiastes is trying to get us to to understand what makes a good life. How do you enjoy life? And we've been looking at some ways in which God has blessed us in order to enjoy life in very little things that God gives us that we consider little things. But now there's an extension to enjoy life, and it is this, enjoy life with others. That we don't simply enjoy our life by enjoying our toil and our food and our drink, as we've been saying. We do, but we also do that when we share that life in relationships. And so what we have here in the text are four sights under the sun. Four observations that Kohelet, the writer, lays out for us, four different subjects that all somehow relate to hardship and companionship. The first subject is oppression, and in the first three verses he says that isolation increases, or, uh, increases the pain of, imp- of, of oppression. Then he talks about toil and how uh, we should think about toil in relation to relationships, our work, our vocation in relation to the people that we love. Then he talks about the blessing of friendships, and then he ends on leadership. So oppression, toil, friendship, leadership, four sides under the sun. He wants us to see the better way to live, and so let's think about it together. First of all, the oppressed and their lack of comforters. He says in verse 1, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. So there's a lot of pain in the world, a lot of oppression under the sun. The text last week ended by talking about injustice. And he continues that train of thought, and he says, Behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power, so there is the abuse of power here, and there was no one to comfort them, that is, those who were oppressed. And so he begins to talk about oppression and the tears of the oppressed. Now, in the Bible, oppression uh, involves, uh, but it's not limited to, things like cheating one's neighbor, Uh, making unjust gain, abusing power, neglecting or harming the vulnerable, denying people of rights and justice. And here we see that those those who are oppressed have a puddle of tears. In Exodus, those enslaved are groaning, and here they're crying. And we know that oppression is awful, from genocide to gendercide, to the killing of the unborn, to sex trafficking, terrorist attacks, sex abuse, child abuse, we could go on. These are awful sights under the sun. And James says one of the responses of God's people is to visit those who are in affliction, those who are oppressed. And that's the main concern here with Kohelet. In verses one to three, it's not so much to tease out what oppression is and what it is not, but it's simply calling it a, you know, it's a reality in life. The real emphasis is on how the oppressed have no comforters. You see it repeated twice in one verse. They had no one to comfort them. And on the side of the oppressors, there was power, and there's no one to comfort them. So isolation increases the pain of oppression. You want to talk about what makes oppression really bad. Here is one of the things. They have no one around them to speak for them, to advocate for them, to comfort them, to be with them. 
And this is why we want to do the kinds of work that we've been praying for and supporting here at IDC for a long time. The kind of, of work that uh, seeks to comfort those who are oppressed. Now he says in verses 2 to 3, the, the, the darkness of oppression is so bad, it's like death is preferable. And this is one of the places, again, where uh, the writer overstates his case as a uh, you know, basic uh, uh, custom in wisdom literature in order to make a point. He's saying this is how bad it is that those who are oppressed are not just oppressed, that's wrong in itself and wicked, but they have no one around them to support them and encourage them. And he says, and I thought the dead who are already dead more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Now that's the sort of thing that you read about in Jeremiah. It's the sort of thing you read about in Job. It's a lament. Lamenting the state of things. Solomon sees life under the sun and it breaks his heart as he sees that oppression is being done, a power, power has be, is being abused, and there is no one to comfort these individuals. So what do they need? Well, they need the comfort of Jesus Christ. They need the comfort of God's people. They need friends. They need family. They need community. They need God's people doing Matthew 25, welcoming the stranger, comforting the hurting, visiting the imprisoned. And that's, 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 that's empowering for us, that you can really make a difference by being a comforter. You know, you don't have to be that skilled to do that. You just need to show up. You remember Job, who lost everything. His friends were really good comforters at first until they started talking, <laughs> right? Like, you, you'd probably be a better one by just staying quiet, hanging, hanging out, being present, you see? Uh, we were reflecting on, on our adoption journey uh, this past week. About 11 or 12 years ago, we spent 40 days in the country of Ukraine in this, this journey, and one of the things we did was every day we visited the orphanage for two hours. That's all we got to do was visit for two hours. And we visited not only with the kids that we were adopting, but also um, the rest of the orphanage. And you can imagine the kinds of kind of relationships you can build in a, in a short amount of time, seeing the same kids every day for 40 days. And one of the hardest days of my life was walking away from that orphanage with all of those kids. What do those kids need? They need comforters. They need family. You may never be a William Warberforce and do something on a massive scale and be heroic like he was, but you can serve a refugee. You can visit the elderly. You can adopt an orphan. What many of us enjoy all the time, and we enjoy this all week long, many of us, is absent in many people's lives. The comfort of a friend. The comfort of uh, someone who loves them, who supports them. Let's see how, how important the ministry of comfort is in the Bible. It's big time. And so he says what really hurts is not just the oppression, though it does, but the fact that they're alone in it. Secondly, he moves from oppression to toil and our motivations in toil. It seems, again, like sort of an abrupt shift from a heavy subject like that to what we do tomorrow morning and all the way through the end of the week or whatever. But it's not. Again, this, this subject of toil is also related to people. And so what he does is he talks about four particular issues related to your work. He talks about envy, laziness, contentment, and greed. So envy is first, verse 4. Then I saw all the toil and the skill in work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after the wind. I talked about this verse a few weeks ago up here on the pastoral panel. Why do you work so hard? Why do you want to do your work, as the text says here, with such skill? Is it because you love God and neighbor? Or is it because you want to outdo someone? How easy is it for us to have twisted motivations when it comes to our work? We can be driven by rivalry, by power, by status. And here the writer sees that this desire to outdo others is the motive for many. We have in our sinful hearts that feeling that Nacho Libre expresses, I want to win, <laughs> right? I want to win. 
We just can't stand the fact that perhaps someone is successful and we are not, or they have particular gifts that we do not have, or they live in a house that we would like to have. We could go on and on and on. That kind of envy drives so many people. And that's a temptation not just you know, among those who are outside uh, the church, but that's, a, that's an issue among Christians. That's, that's an issue among those who are in ministry. To be driven by jealousy and selfish ambition, which by the way, James says is a vile practice to be driven by that. So let's do a little heart check this morning. When we have envy, we usually do these three things. We usually will fantasize about the person, we will demonize them, or we will compete with them, or all the above, and often all the above. That is, fantasize about them. We, we can overestimate their greatness and idolize them. And what that leads to is wanting someone else's life rather than being grateful for your lot and being faithful with what God has given you. Fantasize about them. Or you can demonize them. What happens often with envy is that it turns wicked. And you can end up hating the person you envy. You can criticize or attack the person you envy. What happens a lot is that you gossip about the person you envy. And what's really worse is that you rejoice in the downfall of those you envy. Now that's really evil when your joy is tied to the downfall of another. Or you compete with them. You want to beat them. And all your work is driven by that desire to outdo them. It is very easy for us to have an envy-driven life instead of a Christ-driven life. My friends, when we see our Christian brothers and sisters working skillfully and faithfully, we should rejoice in their success, we should learn from them, and then we should go do our jobs with faithfulness. And we should remember that this kind of envy and rivalry will keep you from having healthy relationships. Because as Proverbs says, envy makes the bones rot. And jealousy makes a man furious. Rivalry and envy will not make us good friends. It will not make us comforters. Because those who are driven by envy are obsessed with themselves. And so he mentions envy. And he goes from there to laziness. This is the opposite extreme of overwork, right? Instead of being driven by envy, you could just not be driven at all. And so what a picture we have in verse 5. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. (laughs) The fool here is is the lazy person. It's the person that Proverbs mentions that that calls the, uh, the sluggard. Now, this is not the working poor, obviously, a person who needs help and assistance. This is the lazy person who refuses to work. And the fool, he says here, folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Folding his hands means that he won't work. Eating his own flesh means that he is destroying or she is destroying himself. There's no food in the cupboard. Instead of going get a job and working and buying food, he's gnawing away at his knuckles. A knuckle sandwich. That's bad. And so you have a workaholic who we rebuke and say, pal, you spend way too much time in the office. But the slugger, we're like, you ought to spend some time in the office. (laughs) <laughs> and this person, as you trace it out throughout uh, the scriptures, we don't have time to do that, but they're marked by several things as we look at the, this theme of laziness in wisdom literature. Uh, that this, this person thinks that everyone should take care of them. And they get mad when people don't take care of them. And what they often do is befriend goodwill people who will help them instead of doing work themselves. Proverbs adds that this person is an immovable object. (laughs) Not only will they not work, they will not listen. And they always make excuses. You remember the proverb where the slugger says, I can't go to work, there's a lion in the road. (laughs) There is no lion in the road. Johnny, go cut the grass. There's no lion in the backyard. And this person is marked by, uh, you know, having, uh, being wise in their own eyes. I love the proverb that says, the sluggard is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. He has seven guys who know what they're talking about. And he won't listen. So he views himself somewhat as a genius. We are not to empower this behavior. We are to rebuke this behavior. 
So we're not to be an envious person, but we're also not to be the sluggard. Oh, what are we to be? Well, verse six, we are to be a content person. This is the good life. Better is a handful of quietness than two handfuls of toil and a striving after the wind. This is beautiful language in the Bible. A handful of quietness is better than two handfuls of greed. Two hands represents a person who's trying to get everything. Like a kid who's at a birthday party and someone hits the pinata, they're not going for a handful of quietness, are they? They're going for two handfuls, man. Everything that they can get and they have no regard for anyone else. They, they want it all. Well, that's the, that's the workaholic here who is weighted down by everything and cannot rest. And what's striking is he has two handfuls, but it's of wind. He actually finds that in working yourself to death, you actually get nothing. What's better is to have a handful of quietness. And so you have a hand that is working, this is a picture, and a hand that has time for people, that invests in others, that makes memory with friends, memories with friends and family, that supports those who are down. So you got one hand that's work, we can't always be on vacation, but there's also a, a hand for life, for people, for love, for support. And he says, this brings a quietness, a tranquility. It brings a contentment. And this is a real challenge for us in America who often praise hard work. And obviously, we've just read, we are not to be sluggards. We are to work. But we can also uh, go the other direction here and be striving and striving and striving and being more and more discontent, especially in the 21st century where we have electricity, which is a blessing in many ways, but that also means you can work all night long. But what you can end up with is having no quietness, no contentment. Paul says there is great gain with godliness and contentment. So have you learned to be content? I would encourage you to look to Jesus. As always, he shows us the best way to live. Jesus did not fold his hands like a sluggard. He worked. Jesus did not envy others who had more stuff than him which was everybody. No, he trusted the Father in everything, and he learned to be content. And by his power and presence, he invites us to live that same way. So there's contentment. Well, we're back to a negative. In verses 7 and 8, there's greed that must be avoided. You can imagine here uh, the, the, the chief executive or the hotshot successful person uh, in your own mind, and as Solomon writes this, again, I saw vanity under the sun, one person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil. And his eyes are never satisfied with riches so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. So we have here this, this, this individual being motivated by uh, greed uh, and he's characterized by frantic busyness. And it's led to isolation and emptiness. You can be rich and alone. And Solomon is trying to show us the better way. This is the individual today that's obsessing over emails, meetings, reports, always thinking about the next thing, the next bonus. And there's no space for social life. There's no space for family. There's no, pl there's no space for church. Why? Because they're so important. This person has money and achievements, but no family and friends. Gibson says, it is possible to know the price of everything, but the value of nothing. So don't be a greedy workaholic. Relationships are more important than achievements. Money and achievement won't satisfy because one, you're made for companionship, and two, you will never think you have enough if that's what your life is about. So we move from this issue of oppression and the lack of comforters in the, in, in the lives of those who are oppressed to what motivates us in our work and, and are we living this life of having a handful of quietness and contentment to now the, the subject more positively of friendship and its blessings. If we need friends, if we need companions, uh, what, what, are, what are the benefits of them? And so here we have a brief paragraph on, gen, again, general observations about life under the sun of the value of friends. And there are really four of them that he lays out for us. The first is, is uh, the benefit of producing or sharing. 
He says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. So success comes from cooperation. If you're going to make some money, if you're going to produce things that are good, then do it with someone else because then you at least can share that together. It's, like, it's a Solomon's way of saying teamwork makes the dream work, as we say today. Contemporary proverb. And I see this in, in every sphere of, of life, and I'm sure you do as well. We're better together. I see it in pastoring, having the great privilege of being simply one of the pastors among so many great pastors. I see it in the work of writing. Nothing would be published without editors who get no thanks for their tireless work. I'm responsible for producing two blogs a week for the Gospel Coalition. None of that would happen without Christy Britton. And it's her birthday today. Um, so thank you to those who are editors. Or if you have a home, you're married. Guys, what would our house look like? That would be bad. Be really bad, right? We, we're better together. We produce more together. Or verse 10, here's another benefit of friendship and, and uh, companionship, helping. This one's very simple. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow, but woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. Some of you remember the old commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. <laughs> I've quoted that many times, man. Uh, I feel like that on Monday. Uh, I can't get up. Now, this is the ancient Near East where it would be uh, very hazardous to travel, especially at night. And if you fall by yourself, that, that you could be in, in big trouble. It could be fatal. And so you need a friend who's with you. That's why we say today, like travel together, right? Somebody can, can help you up. And I think this is a, an illustration of, of what we also need in our own spiritual lives. Many of us may not fall physically. Some may. And that, that is a real danger, especially when the elderly are, are by themselves. But spiritually speaking, we will fall. We do fall, and we need brothers and sisters to help us. That's a good friend to help us up. But if you're consumed with work and you haven't cultivated friendship, will there be anyone there to help you? Well, he moves from producing to helping then to giving emotional support or comforting. Verse 11, again, if two lie together, they keep warm, but how can one keep warm alone? I'm going to quote that to Kimberly tonight. It's a great verse, isn't it? This is before Song of Solomon. Uh, get ready. Pray for the scripture readers uh, during that, that series. Uh, seriously, uh, let me get to it. Uh, so what's he talking about here? This is for all you campers out there. Those of you who like camping, um, bless you. I, I don't. But uh, if you do, you know if you're, you're camping on a cold night, you might say, hey, pal, will you squeeze over here, Okay. This is not some kind of weird sexual verse. This is, this is about, again, the ancient Middle East. You're at, it's cold at night. What do you do? You get close to each other because there's body heat. I was thinking about that scene in Forrest Gump when uh, Bubba, you remember Bubba says to Forrest, I'm going to lean up against you. You just lean right back against me. This way we don't have to sleep with our heads in the mud. <laughs> it's, it's two guys together giving support to each other. And that's the beauty of friendship, isn't it? You're going to go through adversity in this life, and you've got someone there with you to comfort you, to support you. What an incredible blessing that is. And we need to see here from this passage what's quite obvious, and that is technology will never make up for embodiment and being present. You need to be there. Technology can aid in a relationship, but it cannot replace a relationship. You can't keep each other warm online, right? You gotta be together. We're embodied creatures. And then the fifth ble fourth blessing, rather, is protection. Verse 12, uh, similar to the others, but he says, if, if a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will stand to him three, a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So if you've ever been in a fight, you know if it's one-on-one, -on -one, you might have a shot. But if it's two-on-one, -on -one, you're probably in trouble. And so here you have this scene of you need a traveling partner with bandits and criminals out and about. And that's why we say today, I got your back. And it's good when someone's got your back, right? It's good when someone says, I'm with you, I'm watching out for you. There's safety in numbers. And if the companionship of two people is beneficial, how much more, how much, how much more better? How much better 
It, it's three. And that's what he says. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. We are better together. And we have the, the great privilege today of not just saying that we have community, but we have Christ. That we are, they are, we are never alone. That he is with us, that he is in us. When Martin Luther was once asked how he overcame the devil, Luther said, well, when he comes knocking upon the door of my heart and asks, who lives here? The dear Lord Jesus goes to the door and says, Martin Luther used to live here, but he has moved out. Now I live here. We have Christ and we have one another. This is the better way to live. This is wisdom. Therefore, we need each other to stir up one another to love and good deeds, to, to not neglect meeting together, to help and protect and give comfort. Finally, number four, it talks about leadership and the need for humility. Let me read this little parable, this little story, and then show you how humility runs through it. Bredder is a poor and wise youth than an old foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, I think that's the younger one, uh, through it, uh, though, though in his own kingdom he had been, 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 let me read verse 14 again. For he went from prison <laughs> to the throne. I can't read, man. I can't, I can't see. I need, I need bigger print or better glasses, uh, but I'm getting old. Though in his own kingdom, he had been uh, born poor. I saw the living who move about under the sun along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led. Yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is a vanity of striving after the wind. More wisdom here, this time on leadership. Here's the story. You have two kings. Uh, the first king is a foolish king. He's foolish because he will not take advice. He is wise in his own eyes. That's a great warning to all of us, right, that success can make us smug, overconfident, unteachable. This is a man, as Kidner says, who's been too long in the saddle, who is now out of touch and unable to listen so that's the first king in verse 13. Verses 14 and 15 introduce us to a second king. It's kind of a rags to riches story, something similar to Joseph in Genesis or even David uh, uh, ascending to the throne. He grew up poor. He becomes the king. And though he has a large following in verse 16, that king who once was famous and praised is forgotten and replaced. So there are two, two principles here related to humility. The first is that leaders should humbly seek, seek counsel from others. Now this is, this is quite striking, verse 13, isn't it? Often we hear that older leaders are wiser. And certainly that is the case many times. But it's not always the case, is it? Older leaders can also be foolish. This is a picture of an old fool who's just gotten better at doing evil and keeps creating more problems. And it's possible to actually start out well and finish terribly. And for example after example of that, we only need to read the book of Kings. How many of them started out well and ended up a total train wreck? Uzziah, for example, reigned 52 years, one of the better kings, and then it says of him, when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. That's the wrong way to grow, isn't it? To grow proud. He was unteachable. He was arrogant. Wisdom comes from humble godliness over time. And so the question for all of us is, are we getting older or are we getting wiser? And those are not the same. Younger leaders can be wiser than older leaders. Psalm 119, 100. David says, I have more understanding than all my teachers. Older leaders can lose wisdom. So it's not the age that makes the difference. It's the heart. The disciples were very young, many of them teenagers. Timothy was in his early 30s when he was pastoring in Ephesus. But then you have Paul who's 60 and wants to take the gospel where Christ had never been preached. And John who was a very old man when he wrote the book of Revelation. The issue is humility of heart. Leaders are to be humble servants. They are to be teachers, teachable. Now, secondly, you see humility here in the, in the latter part of the story from the younger king who goes to the throne, and we see here that leaders should humbly realize that fame and recognition are short-lived. He says here, he had a great following, 
and then he was forgotten. Another king will replace the king. Another president will replace the president. Another coach will replace the coach. Another pastor will replace the pastor. If something happens to me this week and I don't show up, I don't plan on that happening, by the way. I'm actually moving this week closer to the building. I would be here for a very long time. But if I'm not here, you're still going to have church on Sunday because no one is irreplaceable except Jesus. And when you think about Jesus, you see that these themes of comfort, contentment, and community all converge on him. It is in Jesus that we find comfort. The one who is always with us. We are not alone because Christ is with us. And because of Jesus, we can be content. We don't have to go after two handfuls of everything because we already have the treasure hidden in a field. We, always, we already have that which is more valuable than anything we could accumulate in this life. That's why the writer of Hebrews says, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. What's more valuable than all the money in the world? His presence. He says, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. So we can be content. And it is because of Jesus that we are brought into community. We get to do life together. And this is all by grace, all made possible through Jesus. The one who grew up with nothing. Can anything good come out of Nazareth and ascended to the throne of thrones? And all of this happened because of what Christ Jesus did for us. Christ Jesus experienced oppression. He experienced sorrow. And he had no comforters at the cross. He suffered and died alone in order to bring us into right relationship with God and one another. He died for those who committed the sins in this text, which he himself never committed. Christ died for those who neglected the oppressed. He died for the lazy sluggard. He died for the envious individual. He died for the self-absorbed worker. He died for the arrogant leader who thinks he or she is hot stuff. Christ died for such sinners, and by his power, Christ changes us. He changes us into tender comforters. He changes us into selfless people who love our neighbor. He changes us into people who are content with the basic necessities of life because Christ is better than all pleasures. He changes us into people who pour out our lives for the hurting, and into servant leaders who prepare the way for the future. And our Christ will one day end all injustice and oppression and bring us into sweet companionship with himself and all the redeemed forever. And unlike these, these kings mentioned here at the end of chapter 4, Jesus' glory will not fade away. You see, there is a king who is irreplaceable, who is different from all other kings whose glory will go on forever and ever and ever. This Jesus is the greater Solomon. And this Jesus has come for us. He's come to be our comforter. He's come and brought us this contentment. He's come and he's brought us this community. And we will dwell with him forever. Life under the sun is hard. Life under the sun requires companionship. Life under the sun involves hardship but we look over the sun to Jesus Christ and we look forward to the day in which Revelation says we don't need a sun anymore because the glory of the Lamb will provide it. And it is in this hope and in these gospel truths that we set our heart today and we press on into the future with great confidence and great assurance because Jesus Christ is alive and because he is the King Life is not vanity. And praise be to God that it's true. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word today. Lord Jesus, we're grateful for what you have done on our behalf. As we turn our attention to the Lord's Supper now, we're mindful of the fact that it, it took your torn body and poured out blood to give us such gospel benefits and such incredible hope, unshakable hope. 
increase our gratitude, we pray. Even now as we take the table, deepen our contentment, deepen our commitment to one another and to the hurting. Make us wise people who bring glory to our God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.